Okay, good. So it's wonderful to see all the people who are here from all of our different divisions. And I, I know why this is such a special uh, grand rounds this morning. So my name is Mary Leonard. I'm the chair and it's my great pleasure to welcome you this morning. I uh, want to make sure I call your attention to the incredible lineup. Uh, many of you may know that Congresswoman Kim Schreier from the state of Washington is the only a pediatrician in Congress. And we are very proud that she is one of our own who trained here and has deep ties to Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. And she is going to come give grand rounds next week. And not surprisingly, there's a whole series of events um, that are you know, scheduled around her visit. And so really, really excited about that. And then also an incredibly important topic the following week. And as always, want to congratulate the Grand Rounds Committee because they do such a wonderful job of bringing very timely speakers. And this is about pediatric mental health hospitalizations in U.S. hospitals. Um, and this week, oh, I'm sorry, we always, always have our land acknowledgement. We recognize that Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. Um, and then... Uh, we don't have other announcements. Last week, we I really highlighted the MCHRI symposium. I hope you many of you were able to come. We had a spectacular lineup of a really nationally renowned experts in climate health, and we had engagement with the faculty of the Door School of Sustainability. And so we're hoping last week is really going to kick off a whole new era of collaboration around climate health. But with that, I'm going to welcome Baraka Floyd, Associate Chair for DEIJ, uh, to come introduce today's speaker in honor of Disability Awareness Month. Thank you, Baraka. All right, we are in for a treat today. We have Dr. Susanna Adarola. Um, she's in a a licensed clinical psychologist and associate professor of pediatrics and public health. She also serves as the director for the Strong Center for Developmental Disabilities, a federally mandated university center for excellence in developmental disabilities. The Strong Center for Developmental Disabilities is a network of interdisciplinary centers advancing policy and practice for individuals with developmental and other disabilities, their families, communities, families and communities through research, education, and service. Her research and clinical work focus on programs, services, and advocacy for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities across the life course. With her colleagues, she conducts community-partnered research related to developing, disseminating, and evaluating community interventions to support individuals with IDD and their families. Additional translational research priorities include assessment of parent needs and barriers to self-care, as well as development of programs to help address parent stress and well-being. Much of this research is conducted in collaboration with national multi-site research networks. In addition to scholarship, she engages in development, evaluation, and community dissemination of programs and services in the disability and related fields. She also prioritizes the mentorship of trainees, staff, and junior faculty in research, scholarship, and program administration. And so with that, I give you Dr. Adarola. Thank you, Dr. Floyd. Good morning, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I am Susanna Adarola. Okay, good morning. I have been so excited to come here and talk to you because I'm going to be presenting on a couple of projects that are some of my favorite work that I do. And so I apologize if I'm going to get a little excited about all of this. But I, um, I want to first say that I don't have an acknowledgement slide, like a thank you slide for my community partners, because they're going to be presented as like full collaborators in the work that I'm presenting today. Okay, so I think that's very important to recognize that they're not ancillary to this work we're doing. This isn't a board that we've talked to and have vetted what we're doing, but these are our true partners in each of the projects that you're going to hear about. And so... I am excited to talk to you about that. I don't have any disclosures related to the work that I'm presenting, and we do fully pay for all the images that you see here, so it's all covered uh, intellectual property. If you haven't been to Western New York, and at least one person in this room has lived in Western New York, but if you haven't been there, um, our Western New York community is not like California. I lived in California, actually went to undergrad down in Los Angeles. I adore California. I get excited every time I like land in California. I'm like, I'm here again. Um, Western New York is a little bit different. And so in Western New York, our Strong Center for Developmental Disabilities covers 24 counties west of the Hudson. So I tell people I'm from New York and they think I'm from downstate. And then I say I'm from upstate New York and they think I'm from Westchester. And that's not the way that that works. So I am truly from the West Western area and northern area of New York. And we have 25% of the state's population covered in 75% of its geographic area. Okay, so you've got some fairly like semi urban centers, and you have a lot of sprawl and you have a lot of rurality. 
right? And so you can see why this would be a community that has significant access issues, significant high poverty rates. And in our catchment area, it is approximated that we have about 800,000 individuals living in Western New York with an identified disability. We all know that means there's a lot more people living in Western New York without an identified disability who do actually have a disability as well. So that's the need of the area that I'm presenting on today. And in the context of this, like there are still the same kind of dynamics that happen in big cities as well, right? We have to be mindful of how our institution has contributed to the historical mistrust of medical centers, of providers, and we have to have accountability for that. And if we really want to engage the community in an authentic and appropriate way, it is up to us as the institutional representatives to work and to put in the effort to build those systems of trust again. And so that's why I'm orienting the projects that I'm talking to you about today within the context of dedicated systems of community partnership. These are not things that happen haphazardly. This is not year one of a five-year grant and then we never talk to you again. This is really how do we build up specific and sustainable systems of community engagement and community partnership that include shared decision-making that will ensure that the work that we do is respectful and responsive to our communities and that will lead to better dissemination and better implementation outcomes and better sustainability over time. There are a couple of key ways that we do this and I'm not presenting an exhaustive list of our community engagement uh, systems, but here's a couple of demonstrations of ways that we built up sustainable community engagement uh, efforts. One is through our Strong Center for Developmental Disabilities, which Dr. Floyd talked about a little bit. As part of our federal mandate through the Developmental Disabilities Act, uh, we are also federally mandated to engage a community advisory council that includes at least 50% individuals with disabilities and family advocates. So we cannot have more providers or academics at the seat than those who are the identified population. We are federally mandated to meet twice a year. Like many community advisory councils across the country, we meet four times a year at least. And then we engage folks additionally um, around specific projects. We also use a community uh, research partnership. This is a partnership that we developed approximately 15 years ago for a specific network grant that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. And it's funded by HRSA. And HRSA was really interested in this idea of community engagement kind of before community engagement was a thing with the feds were funding. And so we were responsive to their priorities and around this, this multi-site network developed community research partnership teams at each of the sites. I'm gonna tell you more about that network, I promise. But they have been really specific to not just like program development more generally, but specific to the research that we conduct in terms of identifying research priorities, identifying the, the types of structures and strategies that we should be using, co-development of interventions. And so our research partnership because they are engaged from the very beginning, it leads to better um, opportunities for recruitment. People are actually excited about projects, and so they're more interested in talking to their communities about it. We are starting to build trust in communities where we haven't had trust historically. And so that is another way that we have dedicated meetings and dedicated ongoing relationships with people from the disability community to ensure that our research is responsive and respectful. The key features of our engagement systems that we use include shared priorities, right? Like we're not going to be doing research for research sake. This is, you've all heard, this is the number one criticism, right, of, of federally funded research that we come in and we have all this money and we do the things that we're interested in and we're, we're saying it's for you and for your community and then our money runs out and we go away and then it's just another intervention on the shelf, right? So we, we are really in intentionally talking with our, our partners about how do we identify the priorities for research and program development moving forward. We are very mindful of representation of membership. We don't ever have meetings where there are more representation of individuals without disabilities and individuals with disabilities or family advocates. Um, we also try to be mindful of representing the communities that we are trying to engage in terms of racial diversity, ethnic diversity, linguistic diversity, and um, experiences with our living in urban centers and suburban centers and in rural areas as well. We try to cultivate vulnerability and safe spaces. I'm going to tell you a story that is more specifically tied into that later on. And then this is the key thing for me, right? Shared decision making. When I first started doing community engaged research, when I got to the University of Rochester, my experience with community engagement was advisory boards. 
we have a project. We came up with this cool idea. We're going to do this thing. We presented on it to you. Do you agree that this is a good idea? Oh, yeah, you do? Cool. We did community-based research, right? Like, this is not the kind of approach that's going to lead to true responsivity, that's going to lead to true dissemination and sustainability over time. So our community partners are engaged as key personnel on our grants when possible. One of the grants I'm going to talk to you about today, that's the case. And then in other cases, even if they aren't identified, we do engage them at every step of the way um, to make sure that they have true partnership in the process. And if they tell us that like this thing you wanna do isn't what we actually care about, true community engagement means that we are open to that feedback and we are willing to give up that power and say, okay, we need to pivot and do something else. We work with a sociologist at Drexel University through one of our networks. And I know that the idea of social networks has become a lot more um, commonplace these days. And so this is probably like more of a familiar graph to you, but we've been also really interested in the idea of organizational networks. And when you're doing community engaged research and you're bringing to the table individuals and organizations, we're very interested in what effect does it actually have on these organizations' relationships with each other? Like what is, we have to be like ethically aware of what is the impact of our community process on the community, right? And how are we influencing people's relationships with each other? So we work with Dr. Elizabeth McGee Hasrick, who, um, who works with us and has developed these very uh, like nuanced network surveys that we actually give to our community partners as individuals and as agencies so that we start to develop a picture of what's going on with our relationships with each other. And we're doing this across all our sites across the country. And I'm just gonna give you like a couple graphs that show what some of what we, we, uh, we look at with these relationships. So for example, one of the things is the idea of like how much are folks communicating with each other? And so this is a, a graph of the community relationships through one of our community partnered research grants. And us, our network is at the center in yellow. And you can see that because we are the convening group, everyone's connected to us, right? Like we have a lot of connections among the communities. And you can see that the green dots, which represent school districts and educational agencies that are regional, tend to be pretty well connected to each other and pretty well connected to some of the other groups, like not for, for profit groups and state departments and state funded agencies. You can also see that there are a lot of agencies that are kind of hanging out by themselves. Like we are their only connection and they don't have regular connections with these other organizations as part of their business as usual. Okay, and so to us that says, all right, we're interested in how does this change over time? If we're bringing you to the table over and over again, and we're talking about shared priorities, and we're doing work together, and we're sharing resources, can we demonstrate that over time, the relationships with these not-for-profit and state agencies that are hanging out down here, are they gonna become more connected to everyone else over time, right? That is an influence that we are having in the community. And it's important to recognize that and to understand the impact we're having, but then also, it gives them a sense of where the opportunity is, right? To create more of that cohesiveness. So that's one example. And the other example I'll give you is this idea of trust. And maybe you know more about network analysis than I do, but in network analysis, uh, the idea of trust is really critical and a really important outcome. And so here you can see that there's trust indicated among agencies and the thickness of the line indicates the degree of trust. So we're very happy that at the center of this, we have thick lines, high trust connections to many community agencies. And even though the communication among all those agencies wasn't necessarily there for everybody, there is a level of trust that is indicated among everybody, right? But there's going to be probably a thinner line to these guys down here who didn't really have a high level of communication with everybody else as compared to those who are in the center who are communicating more, which is where trust builds, right? And so again, this gives us a sense of how this looks and what impact we're having bringing these folks together. And it also gives us an idea of how do we build opportunity to develop more trust over time. So it's just a little bit of a different frame in thinking about um, about community work and, and being mindful of the impact that we're having with all of our agencies. We redo these questionnaires periodically. We actually just did another wave. And so I'm very excited to see that from this time point to the current time point that's under analysis at Drexel right now, how have these, have these patterns of communication and trust changed over time? 
So that's a little bit of a context about how we approach community engaged work and how we're trying to measure the impact of our community engaged work at a broad level. But I really do want to focus in then on how are we engaging these community partners in the work that we're doing. And I want to talk about two demonstration projects here. One is going to be in the community, which is where people think about community engaged work happening, right? So ARB is the Autism Intervention Research Network on Behavioral Health. It is a multi-site research network that's funded by HRSA through the Maternal Child Health Bureau. And they are that we are we are currently in our fourth iteration of these five-year grants so we're going on 20 years of funding with the airb network and they have been very interested specifically in supporting equity for individuals with autism and related disabilities that's kind of the charge that they gave out when they initially released this funding opportunity the composition of the network has changed over time. Um, at Airb4 at the current moment, this is our composition. So you see Connie Kazari at the top left. She is the overall PI of the network at UCLA. Aubin Stamer is the PI at UC Davis in Sacramento. That's Elizabeth McGee Hastrick at Drexel, our sociologist I was referring to. Brian Boyd is at U was at UKansas. He's now at UNC actually, but his Kansas site is remaining the primary site with the network. So I'm keeping his face here. He said it was okay. David Mandel is a, is a public health guru and he's at University of Pennsylvania. That's me in Rochester with the bridge behind me. And then Jill Locke is our PI at the University of Washington in Seattle. And you can see that these cities, right, are very different from each other, but they have a lot in common too. This is a lot of opportunity for large catchment areas. Many of these sites are working with very rural um, areas in addition to metropolitan urban centers. High rates of Title I school districts, high rates of poverty, high racial, linguistic, ethnic diversity. So there are some commonalities and um, it really, we, what we have found is that there's a lot more commonalities among the needs and desires of our groups than there are differences. So that's our network. And Initially, when we started the work with HRSA, like I said, they were really interested in this idea of community partnership when it wasn't something that people were talking about that much. And so we partnered with Dr. Loretta Jones. She has passed away, um, it's been about two years now. She was from the Los Angeles community. And she, you've heard of CBPR, community-based participatory research. Dr. Jones coined the term community-partnered participatory research. And she did all the trainings for us initially to kind of help help frame the work that we were going to be doing. And it's because of her that we put such an emphasis on shared decision making, right? She's an individual from a community where decision making hasn't been part of their norm. And so she highlights extensively that if you want to do true community work, you have to give power to the community. And actually, I take that back. She would not say you have to give power to the community. She would say that you have to allow the community to claim their natural power because we as a majority group do not grant power to anybody. Sorry, Dr. Jones. <laughs> so we engaged our community groups um, and we convened them at each of those sites that you saw. We gathered input. We asked them what the priorities should be. And then we engage them as co-developers of our intervention. Okay, the intervention I'm gonna show you, they helped us write it. They told us what they didn't like. They told us what we needed to add. Some of them actually developed the content itself. And then they were full partners and then disseminating it out to the community. And so when they went to folks and said like, this is an intervention that like I worked on and I trust it. And I think that you should give it a try. People were more open to it. And then they were also involved in the interpretation of the findings that we've gathered from the work, and they are listed as co-authors on the paper. So when I talk about the use of, um, or the engagement of a community group throughout the process of a research project, this is kind of the framework I'm talking about. So we went to our sites and we said, okay, HRSA says we need to do work on disparities in autism and related disabilities, okay? And what do you think the issues are with autism and, and health disparities. And we just asked the communities and they talked about, well, we need to be mindful of race and ethnicity. We need to be mindful of heritage language. We have a lot of folks living in high, high um, poverty. And they came up with two overall priorities. One was access to diagnostic evaluations for autism which is, I think, a much bigger <laughs> issue than we were willing to tackle for this project. Um, that's a workforce issue. But the other thing that they said was, when an individual gets a first autism diagnosis, and we know that 
families from low-income households, black and brown children, families whose parents are not speaking English as a heritage language, they're getting their diagnosis already later than everybody else. And there's a long time between diagnosis and uptake to the full and appropriate level of services. This is the gap. Okay, there's this huge gap, and this is a problem because early intervention is really critical. And so that was a theme that was identified across our national network. And we said, okay, that's something that we're interested in doing something about. The, the partners also identified this idea um, of cultural sensitivity. The word minorities here, I will say is a quote, it's not my word. Um, and one of the parents said, well, I think if we're focusing on minorities, cultural matching could help because then that individual could understand basically their experience as well, instead of just being a professional in the situation, right? So that's something that we expected to hear. What we didn't expect to hear as much, which now seems obvious, is this also idea of peer-to-peer -peer support. It's a lot different hearing information from somebody who's just like you than hearing it from a practitioner. This is a quote from one of the parents, okay? In the 10 years since we've done these qualitative uh, interviews, the idea of peer navigation, peer support, the Promotora model um, has gained a lot of traction. And navigation services are a lot more common now, but at the time it wasn't something that was very available and it certainly wasn't available very much in the autism community. And so we said, okay, we heard you. You're, having, you're saying that there are issues with access post-diagnosis and we're saying that we need to develop culturally responsive interventions that are delivered not by a researcher because no one wants to talk to us and as well they shouldn't, but by someone who has shared cultural experience as another parent of a kid with a disability. And they said, yes, that's what we want. And so we said, okay, help us build it. And we called it Mind the Gap to address this gap between diagnosis and service uptake. And we identify it with its key features as a peer navigator program and as a community partnered co-developed intervention. So Mind the Gap is a package intervention. And I just have to take a break here to say, um, Mind the Gap and the, the Airbnb network is why I got hired at the University of Rochester 11 years ago. Um, it was to develop one of the interventions in Airbnb 2. And Mind the Gap came along in Airbnb 3, and I call it my baby. It is like my favorite thing that I have ever done professionally. I love it so much. I light up like a proud parent every time I talk about it. So it's just really thrilling for me to get to talk to you about it now that it's kind of at this stage of development. Thanks for letting me gush for a moment. So it's our packaged intervention, and I'm first gonna talk about content and then I'm gonna talk about structure, okay? So these are our modules, our topic areas, our content areas, whatever you wanna call them, and we put the, them together in a resource finder. This was responsive to what we heard from parents like outside of the research as a clinician too, this is what I hear all the time. There are so many resources out there, they're so great. I wish they were all in one place, right? How many of us have heard this exact same thing? So we said, okay, we're gonna try to put them all in one place. and our our parents on our advisory group told us what these modules needed to be. So we have content related to what is autism and like specifically what does that mean for you and for your child. We have content related to navigating the system. What can you expect to receive in terms of services from the county versus the state versus the school district versus what do you have to pay for privately. We have content related to uh, systems level challenges. What are your rights under insurance? What are your rights as a parent? How do you claim your power around advocacy? Um, some content related to child level characteristics, challenging behavior and communication. And then over here on the right, this is where we really needed to listen to our parent partners who said, we're people too. We deserve to have an, a good experience in our own right, not just as a parent of a child also. And so we developed a lot of content around how to support parent well-being. How do you deal with anxiety? How do you increase your social support network? Mindfulness strategies, healthy lifestyle strategies. Um, and then also a lot of folks said, one of the ma major barriers to access is stigma. If you are dealing with community stigma and intergenerational stigma around your child's diagnosis, that might be the thing that keeps you from picking up the phone and initiating services. So we engage someone with expertise in stigma to help develop a module around that. So altogether, this is our, this is our intervention package. It's implemented only through peer navigators. So when a parent who has a new di diagnosis comes and engages in Mind the Gap, they do not talk to a researcher. They're not talking to a provider. They're talking to another parent of a child with a disability who's gone through an extensive training with us in how to implement Mind the Gap. We aim for about 12 sessions or points of contact over about four to six months. I have done a lot of 
you know, parent training programs that are highly manualized. And we're going to have 12 to 16 sessions and it's going to happen once a week. And every time we meet, it's going to be for an hour. And if you miss two sessions, you're going to get dropped out of the study. Engagement rates in those kinds of programs are not very good for understandable reasons. So we tried to build flexibility in as much as possible so that it could be parent led and also responsive to like the real challenges that parents of kids with disabilities experience on day-to-day -day basis. So it's flexible. You can meet in person if you want. You can meet over the phone. You can use a video conferencing app. We work with an agency in Queens um, that serves primarily Chinese American families. And in their community, they like to communicate through a messaging chat called WeChat. And we have peer navigators who are doing this entire intervention through WeChat because that's how they prefer to communicate. And who are, are we to say that that's not going to be effective? So we're flexible about that. And there is an emphasis on folks who have been historically excluded from the service system. HRSA asked us to enroll at least 50% of individuals for our randomized control trial um, from low income households. And we enrolled 100% of participants from households that were at or below 250% of the federal poverty rate. Because if you can't make something work with folks who have been excluded from the system, it's not something that's gonna be implemented and disseminated with any kind of success in the real world. Here's our coaching model. Um, so over these 12 points of contact, we have a general intake that's focused on rapport building. They engage in a goal setting process. We always include goals related to service access, and we always have the parents set a self-care goal too, as a reminder of the value for their own experience. And then there's just ongoing coaching sessions. Peer navigators check in with the parent. They give them a lot of validation. They set goals that are reasonable. Sometimes that's just finding the number for like the front door for our state disability system. Sometimes it's writing a letter to the school to request an initiation of services, whatever it is. Um, and it's very focused on that shared experience and helping families recognize the power that they have in advocacy. I talked a little bit about some of our engagement strategies, and I will also say that um, translation has been a really important part of the program. So at present, Mind the Gap is available in English, Spanish, Korean, Mandarin, and Bengali, which reflects the primary needs in the cities in which we're implementing Mind the Gap right now. We conducted a randomized control trial. Uh, we didn't want no people to not have access to Mind the Gap. And so our unit of randomization was around receiving family navigation with the intervention. So Mind the Gap plus family navigation versus just the research finder only to engage in a self-directed uh, program. Okay, this is just a quick snapshot. I'm not gonna go too much in depth with this, but this is just to show that we enrolled about 120 families across our sites. Um, you'll see that the, the racial and ethnic breakdown um, is, is pretty split, right? So we have already high, high rates of diversity within the sample. And family income is really important too, right? Like 75% of these individuals are in households that are making less than $50,000 a year. And for those that were making more than $50,000 a year, this was adjusted for the number of folks living in the household. So those households had seven or eight individuals that they were responsible for in the household. In terms of our measures, these were directed both by like, you know, our expertise as professionals, but also what families said were important. So our primary outcome was days to full service access. And then we had 70 secondary outcomes around things like caregiver support, um, their, what their networks look like. Again, like our colleague at Drexel helped us with that. And then family empowerment, their perceptions of how empowered they felt as an advocate for their child. At baseline, this is our baseline results, okay? So at baseline, this is just giving you a picture of what people were receiving. So you can see in the chart on the left that two thirds of individuals were receiving zero community services, community-based services. People were much more likely to have services through school, but still almost half of kids were not receiving school-based services related to their diagnosis, okay? So this is a high level of need for sure. And at baseline, we were interested in what's gonna predict whether you have services or not, because that's an important question too. Um, what we found was predictive uniquely was social support network. The bigger your social support network, the more likely you were to have a service at all versus none. Um, what was not predictive was language, race, ethnicity, caregiver knowledge, or their perceptions of their own agency. But remember again, that this was already like a highly diverse sample. So we might've had a less variability within the sample to begin with. 
These are our primary outcomes from this uh, from the trial. Uh, we will hopefully have this published within the next four to five months, um, but you get a preview. So we did not see group differences for peer navigation versus no peer navigation in terms of time to services. However, what's really interesting is that if you look at the, the mean number of days to service, it's a little less than 100 days, okay? Three months to service uptake is like unheard of. Like that's not what's happening in our community. Maybe it's happening here. I know California's regional system is a lot better than New York's. No, <laughs> but maybe not. Maybe th maybe three months is still not what's happening here either. So you know, we we felt like this was a positive outcome in the sense that like we think that this was helpful in terms of finding services, whether you had navigation or not. Where navigation mattered was for number one whether or not they increased in their social network size. So families who had peer navigation, they had a more significant increase compared to self-directed in their professional network. And if you looked at our baseline results, the number one predictor of services is the size of your social support network, right? So this might be a proxy for more long-term access to services. And then the other advantage to the peer navigation group was around parent perceived empowerment around supporting their child, which is not, is not a surprise given the amount of validation that was baked in to the coaching model. So we do feel like the having resources in one place, like parents have been telling us this for what, 20, 30, 40 years maybe? Um, and it, we finally listened and guess what? They were right. Having information in one place is gonna help you get access to services whether or not you have a coach. But coaches can also help with additional parent identified outcomes above and beyond just access to information. So we do think it's warranted to do a scale up of the implementation of Mind the Gap and other family navigation programs within the disability community. And that's what we're doing right now in our current grant. We're doing an implementation science focused grant, working with training agencies in real world community settings on implementation and success of Mind the Gap. And we've expanded it beyond autism to include all intellectual and developmental disabilities. So that's the community. I think that there are a lot of people who are very on board with the idea of community engaged work out there in the community. And then we walk into a hospital and we completely forget about it. So that's why I'm highlighting our Ascend project as an example of a community partnered project on inpatient units and in ED units in our hospital. ASCEND stands for Advancing Supportive Care Through Education for Nurses on Disabilities. It is funded through our State Planning Council. They just changed their name last week to the New York State Council on Developmental Disabilities. This might be the first time that logo has ever been seen outside of New York. So, you know, you get a little sneak preview. People and are not feeling like my quality of life was important. Like it, it, I was expendable. I think it's due to long wait times. I think it's due to lack of communication. And I think it's due to, honestly, some stigmas and some bias that clinicians have when they see a, a, a Black man in a wheelchair come into an emergency room. I don't think I am a priority in the healthcare system. I find communication in general challenging, even more so with healthcare workers. Because they are not only people I don't know, but they are also uh, people that are in a position of power that could hurt me at any given moment. I'm letting our community lead here, okay? You're gonna see a lot of videos because I don't wanna come up here and like talk about the themes of the issues that we're facing in my words when you could be hearing it directly from individuals. Mike Patterson is the first individual that you saw um, you'll see he's one of our partners on this project. And then this is Lila. She's a 15 year old autistic advocate. She identifies as such. Um, and these are just some examples of some of the real world issues that are happening within our healthcare system. Okay. This supports what we have known about our hospital for a while. And we want to back up some of this information with the quantitative data that we've collected over the years. Um, these are really staggering numbers, but in our inpatient psychiatry units, in our CPEP units, um, we've been really concerned about recidivism. And in pediatric populations, 12% of our patients account, uh, account for 40% of all clinical encounters. And in the adult units, 13% of patients account for 45% of total encounters when you're talking about people with disabilities, okay? 
when you're looking at length of stay in our pediatric inpatient units, there's a high number of individuals who are staying up to two to three months, some who are staying up to 100 days, and we have had individuals 250 days plus on the floor in a pediatric inpatient unit. And in adults, it's even worse. You'll see, right, that there's an even higher percentage of total patients with, with a IDD who are staying for longer than a month on our inpatient units. So this is a systemic issue, and this is representing a huge injustice to patients with disabilities. And that was the inspiration for this project was to identify and like acknowledge that we have an issue in our hospital, in our backyard where we work every day. And it needs to be addressed, particularly for patients with IDD who also have comorbid mental health issues, okay? Mental health conditions, behavioral concerns. Um, these are the things that are bringing people back over and over and over again to the hospital. And that is the focus of this project identifying opportunities to improve care on inpatient and in the ED for pediatric and adults. This is our team. I have to give major props to Dr. Amanda Laprim. She's a doctoral level behavior analyst, and she has been responsible for the development of our behavioral, response, uh, behavioral emergency response program across our inpatient units at the Strong Hospital. And this was kind of her brainchild. And so she and I are partnered together on, on creating this project. Um, Lynn Cole on the bottom right corner is our nursing representation because this is focused on working with nurses specifically. And then here's like our key partnership team, right? Like Mike Patterson is, uh, identifies as a disabled advocate. Tabby Anvari is a family advocate. She has a daughter with a disability and Melissa Bishop is a self advocate. And these are, this is our key personnel team, right? Like they are included on this grant. They are paid on this grant. This is our co-development team for this project. And they're amazing to work with. We wanted to get a better sense of what the needs were. Like we know what the needs are, right? But we also wanted to make sure that we were hearing directly from people with disabilities, which, you know, at a hospital, when you're doing like patient reported outcomes, People with disabilities are often left out of it, right? Or parents of kids with disabilities are often left out of it. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the major themes that we found through our qualitative phase. First was around attitudes toward disability. There was the perception that um, individuals with disabilities were not valued for who they were and that their lives weren't valued. You heard Mike talk about that a little bit. And that there were attitudes and assumptions that were made that were interfering with patient care. There were identified knowledge and skills barriers on behalf of nursing teams, um, both in terms of providing accommodations, in terms of providing adapted care, in terms of understanding medical comorbidities and mental health comorbidities and how that might present with individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So that was also highlighted uh, pretty significantly. And then there were a lot of recommendations made, including from our nursing team around support for accommodations, teaming, better communication, better training. These are institutional level structures that need to be in place so that nurses can feel like they have the skills that they need to do a better job. And I'll let Thomas talk a little bit about an example of that. If I am handing off my patient, I anything that I learned new, um, anything that happened throughout the shift, I'll let them know. Um, I'll let the on oncoming nurse know, uh, especially with like new developments with communication. Um, like nonverbal cues or verbal cues, um, things that I seen that helped me throughout the shift and be effective uh, to promote like more optimal care. Okay, so he's telling us like, this is what's helpful to me, but then he goes on to say like, I need time to do this, right? And the infrastructure doesn't always allow for that. So like, how do we address those types of barriers? I think what happens when you see somebody with a disability, you assume things instead of ask them. We need to ask people, what works for you and what doesn't work for you? Ask me, what works for me? What doesn't work for me? Tina is telling us a very easy, no time strategy. Like this is the number one thing you can do to make my experience better. Just talk to me like I'm a human being and just ask me what I want and ask me what works for me. And then she goes on to say, and when I answer, you have to believe it. Right. Don't make an assumption that what I'm saying is like, I don't understand my own experience or I don't understand my own health care. 
We supplemented our, quanti our qualitative data with quantitative data too. We surveyed um, hundreds of individuals with disabilities, family members, and then nurses as well. And we have a lot of data and presenting just a couple uh, just to highlight. And I think what's less important here are the, are the responses and like the, the numbers versus the patterns that we're seeing. So this is a rating of what is your, your perceived, if you're a nurse or you're perceived as a patient, level of nurse comfort and effectiveness engaging with patients with IDD and higher numbers are indicative of higher levels of comfort. And it's interesting that all the nursing scores are kind of hanging out over here and they're like, yeah, like I'm not saying I feel 100% comfortable. I know there's work to be done, but I feel pretty good about it versus the experience of people with disabilities and families who are saying, I don't feel like nurses know what they're doing. I don't feel like nurses have a high level of, of comfort and a high level of competence in terms of what I need as an individual. And it's very clear, like nurses are so busy and well-intentioned and they're doing such amazing work. And a lot of this is just like a mismatch in understanding and communication. So this is our opportunity. How do we bring these together to create more shared understanding of what the experience really is on the inpatient units? Because this isn't saying that nurses are doing a bad job. It's just saying that our perceptions of an experience are completely different because we don't have opportunities to come together around it. As other examples, these are um, perceived barriers to care. Okay, so I'm going to start with the bottom, actually. This is, do you think that attitudes about people with disabilities contributes to a lack of care? And nurses, 15% of nurses said yes. Everyone else was like, no, no, like, we don't, we don't have biases about people with disabilities. Like, we have positive attitudes. It's not an issue. 85% of people with disabilities said, uh-huh, you guys are experiencing bias and I'm feeling like you're not understanding my experience and I feel judged and you're making assumptions about me. That is a huge mismatch in experience and perception. So again, like it's not to say that like nurses are, are, are deliberately unaware or don't want to do a good job or don't have good clinical skills. It's just about there's not opportunities to really talk about this and share in an experience with the lens of someone who might be on the other side of the patient encounter. And how do we create that opportunity? Where there is more agreement is at the institutional level and the infrastructure level, nobody thinks that there's enough support, right? So we need more environmental supports. We need time. We need resources. We need higher staffing ratios, right? So there's a lot more concordance around perceptions of what's needed on the units, which can be helpful too. So high levels of agreement in some ways, but when it comes to personal experience, less so. This is the basis of our ASCEND project. We are training nurses on inpatient and ED units, PEDS and adults um, across a three-tiered system. And so we have a five-year grant through the New York State Council on Developmental Disabilities. We are about to wrap up year one, which was to develop our training in partnership with our, with our disabled community. Next year, we're doing a pilot, a rollout at the University of Rochester Medical Center. Year three is going to be around evaluation and refinement. And then we're I, we were hoping to scale up to 10 partner hospitals across New York State to do dissemination and replication. We have recently become open to the, idea, to the idea of doing this outside New York State. So on my very last slide today, you will see a QR code. If you are interested or you know like someone who might be interested in having a replication at a hospital here, um, please indicate your interest because we would love to find ways to work with other hospital systems too. And then we'll do our final full scale evaluation in year five. So we're just at the beginning of this. We're using a tiered system of training. Tier one is focused on didactic modules that are built into the, the training platform. It's called My Path at Our Hospital, um, which will be assigned as mandatory to all nurses. And here are our five modules that were developed in collaboration with our partners. Um, the first is on medical comorbidities and how that might present in individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. There's a module on mental health, this being primarily around comorbid mental health conditions, and I'll let Lila talk a little bit about why that's important. What do you think that they could learn or they should know that would help um, in those specific situations, emergency room situations for people with developmental disabilities, particularly kids? Try to get them to a not super loud room. That'll probably help them be less stressed. And stress can really influence how people behave in medical situations. It's Part of why I could not keep my composure during the second seizure. I wasn't in pain, but I was stressed because I thought I would get an IV. And no one really reassured me that I wouldn't need one because I wasn't bleeding. 
and a lack of reassurance really stressed me out. We have a module focused on attitudes and barriers to care. Um, this was like resonating loud and clear, right, from all the qualitative and quantitative work that we did. So we have a whole module that's just focused on the disability rights movement and value for disabled lives and the types of biases that folks encounter in the hospital and how can we um, use better engagement strategies and, and see a person for who they are. It's hard to, for me when I go into a doctor's office or a nurse or emergency and they immediately judge me instead of looking at me, looking at my chart. Don't judge me because what you're going to judge me on is my talking, my walking, my fine motor. So many people, when they hear my speech, think I'm drunk. That would be being a 24-hour alcoholic. That's a lot. I don't think a lot of clinicians go into rooms with people with disabilities with an open mind. I think as soon as they read that chart, I think the assumptions come. So that's what we're a trying to combat. A lot of people with developmental disabilities or even ones that are nonverbal still understand what you're saying to them. Um, so I think that some providers just go in with kind of the idea that every, they're all the same and you know that to me that's like a terrible misconception and kara is one of our nursing leaders right so she's like i'm experiencing this on the floor too i see this too i'm not a person with a disability and i see it unfold right in front of me we have a module focused on adaptive nursing care, including adaptive equipment, accommodations, um, and appropriate um, engagement with folks medically around their needs. And I'll let you're going to hear from one of my longtime collaborators and very good friends, JD, about her experiences. You'd be surprised how many doctors are afraid to touch disabled people, right? And so, like, I've gone to the doctors and never been touched, and it's weird because it's like, I'm not coming here to see you and say, hi, how you doing? Like, I'm coming here because I have a need or something hurts. So a lot of the times, um, just because of my life's experience, I'm not proactive when it comes to health crisis. Like I'm coming to you when I'm at the worst, when it's like, I need, there is nothing else I could possibly do. It's a huge issue, right? That's, that's what leads to health inequity right there. She's not coming to the doctor because she doesn't trust that she's gonna get what she needs. And so she's in crisis by the time she makes it to any medical provider. And I've seen this happen. I'm her friend. Like, I, I know this is true. Um, and then finally, our final module is related to managing medical and behavioral crises, especially on, on our PEDS units. Um, this has been a, a focus of a lot of work. So the, that's our tier one. Um, tier two is going to be focused on developing uh, very refined and nuanced simulations, right? Like simulations are an important part of nursing training. And so we want to make sure that disability experience is represented within those. And then tier three is matching with lived experience where we're going to have nurses um, partner with patients with IDD and families and like not in a patient encounter, but like sit down with them and like, let's talk about what actually happens so that they actually get contact with individuals around um, what their experience is truly like. In terms of evaluation, we're going to be looking at key mechanisms of change, attitudes, organizational climate is really huge, and perceptions of clinical comfort, as well as more effectiveness outcomes like completion rate of training, post-test performance, and nurse satisfaction with the, with the training. And then we'll be scaling up to our 10 partner hospitals, okay? Good patient care is listening, kindness, understanding, and just treating me as a person first who happens to have a disability. So I think Tina just gives a good overall summary of why this work is important. I'm gonna thank our funders Air for Airb and Ascend. And I'm gonna end with a story, if that's okay. So recently we had to, as an Ascend team, present to our nursing leadership, including the Dean of Nursing at a big meeting on this project with the idea of like, let's get buy-in for folks to make this a mandatory training, okay? And Amanda had invited Mike Patterson, our advocate to come. And then she found out that the presentation was limited to 10 minutes. So we're in an administrative meeting, me, Amanda, and our grants administrator. And she's like, oh, 
we got this like meeting coming up and I invited Mike to come talk, but like, we got to get through everything. Like, you know, uh, can you help me figure out like, how do we talk to him about just like limiting his comments? And like, what if he goes over and we don't have time to get through the whole project? And like, Amanda's a lovely person. She loves Mike, she values Mike, but in the moment she was really anxious about this meeting. And I was like, yeah, that, that sounds hard. And then I was like, well, like, so what? So what if Mike goes over? Like, you know, maybe this is exactly what this is intending to do, right? Like we need him in the room. We need people to hear directly from him about this. And like, maybe that advances our work more than us talking. And she steps back and she's like, oh my God, I just did the thing. Like, and then she starts having all these ruminating thoughts and she's like, we need to process this in our team meeting, right? So directly after this meeting, we have the team meeting with all the partners and Mike's there and Tabby's there and Melissa's there. And she's in her, in, Amanda in her infinite wisdom and vulnerability says, listen to what I just did. And she tells the story and it launches into this 45 minute conversation about, you know, how this happens and why isn't Mike the one in the room? Why isn't the assumption that he needs to be the one in the room? And he validates her and he's like, yeah, you know, Amanda, like, I get it. But like, yeah, this, this is why I don't end up in front of nursing leadership. And this is a proxy for what happens in the room in the hospital. And it's like, okay. And then one of the nurses on the team says, I've seen this happen in the hospital. Someone comes in and they make an assumption and they express a bias and no one checks them. And then it gets passed on to the next provider and then the next person. And then you're going down the rabbit hole and nobody knows how we got there, right? And this is not to say that like, I'm a good person because I stepped in and said something. I stepped in and said something because I have said the wrong thing so many times and I have not said the right thing so many times. And it is not the responsibility of disabled individuals to teach me, but I have learned a lot from them, right? And I just happen to be the one in the room, okay? And so I tell this story as like an example of how we want to cultivate that kind of space. We need to cultivate in community partnered research a space where an entire team meeting can be taken over by this process. And we don't get done what was on the agenda because that's the important stuff. And what ended up happening is we said, we need to bring this to simulations. We need an example of what, how that happens to our simulations. And then in the end, the intensity and the openness to that experience actually helped to make our work better. Okay, so I'm gonna end today with the way that, with a quote from Mike, because that's how he ended that meeting. And I think that that's how this needs to end today. So to quote Mike directly, get out of your comfort zone so that the real work can begin. Thank you. I think there's a couple minutes for questions. Yeah. Thank okay. you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, we'll take some questions. That was wonderful. Thank you. And um, reflecting on my own time in Rochester, and thinking about the community and the relationship of the medical center in the community. Mm -hmm. um, how do we address the barriers in other communities with much more competitive markets for academic medical centers so that the same kind of embedded engagement that works well in upstate New York can be replicated? So you're referencing the idea that U of R is the only game in town, right? <laughs> it kind of is, yeah. No, that, that's a really good question, right? Because this isn't the easy path, right? This is the path that takes more time and it takes more resources, right? So I think that there's been a shift in terms of research priorities. We are starting to see this, like even up at the NIH level, right? Um, PCOR has been doing this for a long time where our, our conversations need to create value for what this kind of work can do for hospitals, right? And that shouldn't be our driving force, but sometimes that's the frame I think that leadership needs to hear to say, this is something that's worth putting resources into. And the more that we can orient around um, specifically like seeking funding opportunities that are framed under community engaged work or do require that component of community engaged work and lifting up the value for that and making that very visible within hospital systems right like this this is send grant this is money saving in the end right like this is not why we're doing it but when we talk to the dean of nursing and hospital leadership that's what we're talking about and so you have it's about connecting our values right to what matters to others um, I will say the another thing that we're doing at U of R is we have in the Department of Pediatrics a strategic planning committee process going on right now, and there's a research component to it. And I joined the research component specifically to say, like, we've never talked about community engaged work and the value for that at a department level for researchers in, in pediatrics. And why is that? So we're starting to do an assessment of community engaged work in the entire department, and the results of that will be used to help 
kind of get a picture of what's going on and to lift up the folks who are doing that kind of work, but also to identify opportunities for training, right, for others or to make connections to folks who might want to do this, but they don't know how, or like, how do we do community engaged work when we're bench researchers? How do we bring people together in a translational context, right? So making it, I think the first step is just making it visible and expressing value anytime you can at a high level and hoping that attitudes and cultures change over time. I thank you for coming and for this enlightful presentation, enlightening presentation. Um, I thought it was really impactful how you used in the first presentation, the community partners to synthesize the fragmented systems for the families. What do you think will take, uh, what do you think it'll take for, to reduce the fragmentation between like the educational, the developmental systems and the health systems um, more systemically? In New York state, I will say it's a huge, obstacle that we're trying to, to advocate for at the policy level. So, you know, we can't, we can't lobby, but we educate. And so that's a major component of our Center for Excellence is, is education. So um, that exact issue has been, is something we talk about anytime we enter a room with legislators um, at the state level and at the federal level also, because this isn't, I know this isn't a New York thing, like this is, this is specific and diffuse across, across the nation. So um, making folks increasingly aware of the issues that come from like, you know, dual dipping and um, how developmental disability systems and mental health systems like don't talk to each other. Um, I think that's, that's one opportunity, bringing folks together across agencies and making them aware and increasing communication and trust, I think is another way to start to at least if people can't cross the systems, they can become increasingly aware of what's available to them right across systems. Um, so I think that's another opportunity. And then we we have focused on opportunities that we might not have otherwise specifically because they bring systems together. So I'll give you an example. We recently were offered a contract with our Office for Mental Health in New York State. Uh, are folks familiar with the ECHO model? Like it's like a telementoring model that's in designed to increase care in community settings. And um, they wanted us to do an echo for our crisis call workers around how do you better support people with disabilities who are calling. And we were like, oh my God, we don't have the personnel for this. Like, do we really wanna take this on? And they said, oh, we're also gonna have people from OPWDD, which is our state disability organization. Their crisis workers are gonna sit on it too. And we said, okay, yeah, we're doing that. Like, we'll, we'll take that contract, right? Because OMH and OPWDD are never in the same room in New York, right? And so here's an opportunity for us to build relationships and a network and a collaboration across two systems that have been kind of at heads, at loggerheads for a really long time. And we had these planning calls and we had leaderships from both systems together on the calls talking about our shared priorities and values. So that was lucky that we got offered that. We were lucky that they wanted to engage the DD system, but saying yes to that opportunity and now thinking about like, what else can we offer cross systems to help to build those relationships can we do? Like that's another strategy I think we're taking. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. I am speaking um, as my role as a pediatric residency program director, Carrie Rosbach, and um, I think you shared some really beautiful examples of community partnered participatory research. I'm really grateful for our many faculty in our department who are also modeling and teaching our residents how to do that type of research. So that is really inspiring. And I also just wanted to say thank you to our HEAL program, which is our department's um, faculty and staff professional development program, which is focusing on disability education this year. And so all of our faculty and staff should be receiving education and our, our trainees as well. Um, and I I just think we have so much more to learn about this, including how to support folks in our own community who are providers with um, disabilities as well, and how we can do a better job of supporting their needs. So thank you so much for your work. Thank you for sharing what's happening here as well. And I'm meeting with folks throughout the day, and I'm excited to learn more about the ways that you're you're supporting everybody. I, I told someone recently that I was coming here and they're like, oh my gosh, they do such a wonderful job like with neurodiversity training and supporting people um, in their understanding of the disability experience. So that's definitely, um, there's a level of awareness of the work that you've done here on the national level. Um, I think we have time for one more question um, before we close. 
I think the question that I had is, um, as you think about how to make space in an academic setting um, to create space for community engagement and to create space for those deeper conversations, how has your team gone about setting the table for that? I think there's a few ways that we've we've kind of approached it, right? We, Whenever we have new projects, we've increasingly tried to make this like a, a required component, right? And so I think the first way that you set the table is you put your money behind it, like honestly. So people unfortunately assign value to things that are attached to money. And that creates a level of officialness that might not otherwise exist. So we build this all into our budgets from the start. That's the number one way is we, we build people, personnel, as key personnel into the budgets. Um, the Mind the Gap project has spent in the past three years over $20,000 on interpreter and translation services. We had to build that into the budget, right? So we have to be intentional, intentional about where we're, about how we're providing our own infrastructure to support that at the very beginning, right? We try to lift up the work and make sure that people know that our partners are contributing intellectually, right? Any opportunity we get, that means making sure that Mike's in the room when we talk to the nursing leadership and inviting folks at any point. Um, that means like, I can't bring people out here with me, right? But I can have their words represented instead of me trying to pass it off as my interpretation of what's happening, right? So we can let folks uh, speak in their own words and kind of elevate them throughout the system. And then we try to be really um, vis like, vocal and visible when we do our work. So one example of the way that we do that is we create lay person summaries of our work, research briefs or like program development, program evaluation, and we create infographics and they're in lay language and we try to get them translated and then disseminated through the community because data belongs to the community when you're doing community engaged research and we all have a responsibility and accountability to share that back with them. And so, these are things that we, we try to do to kind of increase the visibility of the work that we're doing with the hope that the value comes along with that. Um, and that also means communicating a lot with our University of Rochester PR group to make sure that they're doing a press release on this nursing training grant and that what's highlighted in that press release isn't all the doctors on it, but are the community members who are contributing to the work and that their photos are in that press release too, right? So it's, 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 a lot of work because it's always pushing back and it's always being intentional and it takes a lot of time. But those are the ways that we're trying to set the tone for how the value for this work should be perpetuated throughout the institution and beyond. So much. So nice to meet you all. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.